Well, let's go ahead then and walk through the review questions, make sure that everyone has a, a handle on those. You did these last Monday on your own, kind of a study hall class with Mrs. Uh, Piercy. And um, here we go. Number one, can an element undergo decomposition? Can an element undergo a decomposition reaction? No. It cannot. Remember, an element, we define an element as something that is the product, product of a decomposition reaction that cannot be decomposed anymore. So if you've got an element, you have all atoms of the same thing. It's an individual element, it's not a compound. And decomposition is taking a compound and breaking it into its constituent elements. So no, an element cannot undergo a decomposition. Number two. Classify the following reactions as decomposition, formation, complete combustion, or none of these. Just walking through. Number one. Complete combustion. Number one is a complete combustion. Yeah. How do we know a complete combustion reaction? Uh, I have uh, reacts with whatever. Or has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And then it, the product has uh, carbon dioxide and water. What I'd like you to remember is that it's a reaction that it, something, re, something, a fuel, reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water vapor. A fuel, which in this case is C6H12O6, reacts with oxygen, the 6O2, to produce some combination of carbon dioxide and water. That's a combustion reaction. That's not the combustion, that's not the, uh, remember the metal Metals don't produce when they burn, don't produce CO2 and H2O, but other chain fuels do. Number two, what kind of reaction is that? The 2H2 plus O2 produces 2H2O. Is it, is it formation? It's a classic formation. You're taking your constituent elements in the front end, combining them for, to produce a product, which is the combination of you know just the original ones brought together to form one molecule. Now, re remember that it doesn't have to be just one molecule. It has to be building up something. Technically, a formation reaction is you're taking the building blocks, the individual Legos, and you're building some structure out of them. You're, you're bringing structure into it. That's a formation reaction. A decomposition is where you're taking a structure and you're breaking it down into the individual constituent elements. For our purposes, we tend to assume we're going to drive it all the way down to individual elements on a decomposition, and we're going to drive everything into one single molecule in formation. That's not technically the way it has to be all the time. That's the way we do it in this class, to keep it simple as we're learning it. So remember that. A formation reaction doesn't mean it only produces one molecule. It means it brings structure and builds compounds from the constituent elements. In a decomposition, it doesn't mean it always takes it all the way down to the individual elements, but it does decrease the structure. It does take molecules and break them down. That's the main thing to remember. Number three, with the sodium chloride and the silver nitrate. <clears throat> What kind of reaction is that? We have decomposition, formation, complete combustion, or none. Is it none? It's none. It's none of those. You're not building up anything uh, new. You're not tearing anything down. You're basically exchanging. And it's not reacting with oxygen, so it's a none of them. Compared, it's not decomposition, formation, or complete combustion. What about D? Pardon? No. It's not, not as well, right? It's not building, breaking up, or burning, combusting. It's another rearrangement. And lastly, E. Decomposition. E is a decomposition, right? You're taking a, a molecule and you're breaking it up into its constituent elemental forms. So E is a decomposition. Number three asks, which of the following is not a formation reaction? Excuse me. Yes, Will. Um, on number two, or actually for any of these, do we have to list, list if it's a solid gas or liquid all the time? Do you have to list all the time? It'll, it'll tell you in the problem to include the phase symbols. If it says phase symbols, then you need to show is it gas, liquid, or solid. And also, it's really for you to visualize. You know, if, you, if I look at one of these, for example, uh, 2C, I've got sodium chloride solid, which means I've got crystal, right? I've got solid sodium chloride. I'm going to mix it into a silver nitrate, which is aqueous. It means that silver nitrate is already mixed in water. It's already in a solution. So I can visualize the problem. And sometimes it'll help you work through. Later on, when we get to um, kinetics, or excuse me, um, energy and activation energies, 
the phases are going to matter a lot more if, if we get there. That's one of the last couple chapters. We may not get there before the end of the year. But if we do get there, that's when phase becomes much more important. At this point, it's more, I think, for you to visualize it. Okay. So it'll ask you to include phase symbols. And sometimes when we're, like, for example, just balancing the equation, it doesn't matter what, if, what the phase is. I may drop the phase symbols. And I'll try to remember to tell you, hey, I'm dropping phase because it doesn't really matter in this problem. Okay. It has more to do with energies than it does counting the elements. Number three, which of the following is not a formation reaction? A. A. A is not a formation. Everything else is taking constituents or taking components and building up to the, to the greater. Two doesn't do that. It does, also doesn't break it down. It's just a different kind of reaction. Number four, which of the following is not a combustion reaction? B. Yeah, B. B, right. Now, this is where you need to look at both the reactants and the products. Remember, for combustion, it reacts with oxygen and produces, in the case of chain fuels, carbon dioxide and water. In the case of metals, it take, creates the metal oxide. So as you look at four, all the different options you have, the first one reacts with oxygen. Uh, so A reacts with oxygen. C and D both react with oxygen. B does not react with oxygen, so it can't be combustion. And then look at the products of reaction. For, the, for A and C, it's a carbon-hydrogen chain and produces carbon dioxide and waters. And D, it's a metal oxide. Okay, so you've got all the components of combustion in A, B, and D, but not, or excuse me, A, C, and D, but not in B. It does not react with oxygen. Even though it produces carbon dioxide and water, it's not reacting with oxygen. Now, what does B represent? What kind of form, what kind of reaction is B? Decomp. Decomp, yeah. It's a form of, you're taking a larger chain molecule and breaking it into smaller molecules. But again, like I said, we tend to take it all the way down to the element. But this is an example of breaking it down into lesser structured molecules. Taking one great molecule, breaking it down into two smaller molecules. So you can visualize this being a process. Taking a large molecule, breaking it down into two smaller molecules, taking each of those and breaking them down into their constituent elements to be a two-phase process of decomposition. It's a possibility. All right. Number five, what's the difference between complete combustion and incomplete combustion? Uh, incomplete combustion has a carbon monoxide. Right. Carbon monoxide. Right. So if a product of an incomplete combustion is carbon monoxide, the product of complete combustion is carbon dioxide. So again, we tend to um, bring anthropomorphic type of ideas or personify things. So I'll say the reaction wants to do something. You know, sometimes we say an element likes or the element wants to become an ion. Aluminum, what does it want to become? It wants to become plus three. There's no emotion from the element. There's not this kind of thinking doesn't take place. So we can say that the com in a combustion reaction, the reaction wants to produce CO2, carbon dioxide. There are times when there's insufficient oxygen, and it cannot make CO2. There's only enough oxygen to make CO. So with limited oxygen, there's limited oxygen in the reaction, it can produce a legitimate molecule in CO, carbon monoxide. That is a legitimate combination. Not preferred, <coughs> but it can be done. So in the case of limited oxygen, it'll produce carbon monoxide. And for us, the difference between complete and incomplete combustion is deadly, right? Carbon dioxide is deadly only if it evacuates everything else. Like if there's not enough oxygen in the room because there's too much carbon dioxide, it becomes deadly. But carbon monoxide in and of itself is deadly. So just be aware of that. Part of that has to do with the fact that the carbon monoxide really wants to be carbon dioxide. And so when it enters your system, it's going to start taking your oxygen away. And so though you take the oxygen in, it's reacting and removing the oxygen. So that's why carbon monoxide is a poison to us, and why we need to be aware of it. Which leads into the next question. Number six, what does a catalytic converter do for an automobile? Someone other than Ray. Appreciate your participation, Ray. It's been awesome. But what does a catalytic converter do? I know what it is. What was that, Will? It's going to convert carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. Right. There's a reaction taking place in the catalytic converter. It has to do with the properties of the metals that are inside of it. 
And so the catalytic converter is constantly converting carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide before it comes out the tailpipe. So it's taking poisonous gas that the engine creates when there's a lack of oxygen, insufficient oxygen, and bringing that other oxygen molecule into it to make sure that it leaves as a non-lethal gas. Remember, the, the imagery to remember is years ago, people used to commit suicide by running their automobiles in their garages, getting terrible headaches while they passed out and dying from carbon monoxide. Now you just get a terrible headache because you're basically evacuating the oxygen and breathing in a whole bunch of carbon dioxide. That's why also you can't just go and cut out the catalytic converter and extend your tailpipe between the two. At least hope you don't, right? It changes the way your engine behaves. It changes the resistance in the exhaust system. But it also removes that protection that you have for yourself and for others and the environment. So you become a carbon monoxide producer. The older the car, the worse the tune, all that kind of stuff makes more carbon monoxide. Number seven, which has more mass, 100 hydrogen atoms? four sulfur atoms, or one lanthium atom. Now that one you kind of had to remember doing the work, right? But lanthium, let's see, hydrogen has a mass of about one AMU, right? So we're looking at about 101 AMU for 100, ox for 100 hydrogens. The sulfurs have a mass of 32.1, so we're looking at about 128.4 AMU for the four sulfur atoms. Lanthium has a mass of 138.9 AMU per atom. Okay. Now, real basically, just to go back to where did I get these numbers from? Hydrogen, we look at the periodic table and find the atomic mass of the element. The mass here on this chart is 1.00794, and your book is probably rounded to 1.01, okay? But whatever, that is the atomic mass. Now, what are the units? Remember we said that coefficients or numbers have no meaning unless they have a unit behind them. So I say the atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.01, what are my units? My units are AMUs if I'm talking about the individual atom, right? So 1.01 AMU per atom is the mass. So now that I've got a unit of mass, I can compare things. 100 hydrogens is 101 AMU. Sulfur, each one over here is 32, so four of them is 128, which is more. 101 or 128? 128, right? That's four sulfur compared to one lanthium. Lanthium down here is 138. Point 0.9, which is more, 128 or 138.9? Lanthium, right? So the one, one atom of lanthium has more mass than four atoms of sulfur, which has more mass than 100 atoms of hydrogen. Now, just to review as well, on the periodic table, we see hydrogen has 1.01 AMU per atom. We also know that that 1.01 means that there are 1.01 grams per mole. 1.01 AMUs per atom, 1.01 grams per mole. We just change the units from AMUs to grams and change our what we're counting from atoms to moles. Remember, mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of them, Avogadro's number. So with the same number, the same coefficient, we're just communicating two different things. How much each, what is the mass of each individual atom in AMUs, and what is the mass of a mole of that atom in grams? Number eight asks, what do the following things have in common? 32.1 grams of sulfur, 40.1 grams of calcium, and 60.1 grams of silicon oxide. Silicon dioxide. Let's do a little investigation. What's the first one? What do they have in common? 32.1 grams of sulfur. If I come over to the sulfur, and they're saying I got 32.1 grams. I notice that sulfur has an atomic mass of 32.06, which in your book may be rounded up to 32.1. There's a clue there, isn't there? 32.1 grams of sulfur, and it has an atomic mass of 32.1 grams per mole, or 32.1 AMU per atom. So how many 
how much sulfur do I have if I've got 32.1 grams of sulfur? I have one mole, right? If I have 32.1 grams of sulfur, which has an atomic mass of 32.1 AMU <coughs> per, per atom, then I have one mole if I have 32.1 grams. One mole. The second one they offer is 40.1 grams of calcium. If I come over here and look at calcium, I see it's 40.08, probably rounded to 40.1 in your book. So, if I've got 40.1 grams of calcium, how much calcium do I have? One mole of calcium. And lastly, 60.1 grams of silicon dioxide. I'd have to go over to silicon, right? Where are we at here? Silicon over here is 28.0855, probably about 28.1. Oxygen is at 16, so 32 plus 28 puts you around 60.1. Hey, guess what? What are they communicating here? In each one of these instances, I have one mole of that element or that compound. If I were to break it down into individual pieces, in the case of the two that are in their atomic form, the elements, I would have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of each one. And in the case of the compound, I would have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of that compound. But I have a mole of each. So what do they have in common? They all represent one mole of that element or that compound. All right? But this is what this chapter is about, is relating masses, counts, so think in that vein. What do they represent? I have no clue. Assume it has something to do with the mass and the count. And that'll lead you into that answer. So what is Avogadro's number and what does it represent? We've just used that several times, right? Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It represents the number of pieces, whether mo atoms or molecules, that make up one mole of that element or compound. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of that. But remember, it was developed by doing experimentation and having a constant in there. There was always a multiplier. Hey, this will work if I multiply everything by some factor of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Two times, three times. Why does this number keep appearing? And then in the investigation, why does this particular constant keep appearing? The fact that it was the number in a one mole came forward. So it was developed experimentally. What are the two ways the following equation can be interpreted? Number 10. This one is not intuitive, okay? I recognize some of you struggled with this. Maybe you're like, what exactly are they asking for? What they're, what they're driving at here is, okay, I'm not gonna write it on the board, but the formula says two C3H8O plus nine O2, right? Reacts to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now you may have put an answer in there that, hey, it's a combustion of this chain to produce carbon dioxide and water. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Okay. What the authors here are actually driving at is when you look at this equation, what it's telling you is that two molecules of the chain fuel plus nine molecules of oxygen react to produce six molecules of carbon dioxide and eight molecules of water but it also simultaneously communicates that two moles of the chain plus nine moles of oxygen react to produce six moles of carbon dioxide and eight moles of water. So the coefficients in the balanced reaction equation represent how many individual atoms or molecules are needed and will be produced, and it simultaneously represents how many moles are needed and how many moles will be produced. And it's a proportional relationship. For every two, there's one. For every three. And what we'll be, we'll be able to do in the future is to look at a complete balanced reaction equation and say, if I have this much of one of those, how much of, every, how much of this do I need, and how much of this will be produced, and how much of this will be produced, all based upon knowing one of them, you can compute what all of them need to be or, or will be. Okay. So once you have the balanced reaction equation, you know how many molecules of each thing is needed, and how many molecules of each thing will be produced, or atoms. And you also know how many moles of each thing would be needed in order to produce how many moles of each thing that's produced. Two pieces of information at the same time. In much the same way as the mass is both 
the AMUs per atom and the grams per mole of that atom. Two pieces of information with the same, two pieces of usable information with the same numerical information presented. So that's the key to number 10, is recognize that the coefficients in that balanced reaction equation represent the number of molecules needed and the number of molecules that would be produced. It also represents the number of moles that would be needed to produce the same number of moles in the end, products of reaction. Okay. So those are the review questions. Any, any big issues with review questions now? A few that I looked at look pretty good. I know that number 10 was a little bit confusing of what are they actually asking. And if I had been here to give you a verbal hint, I'm sure you would have been able to get close to that answer. Okay, start working, at least be looking in your text and pushing towards that kind of an answer. Without me being here, and I know Ms. Kersey couldn't just give that to you. So you were, you were stuck to interpret the question on your own. But any questions for me on the review questions? Because we'll jump into practice problems if not. Everyone, everyone had number one correct on the practice problems, both all the groups. So I can't really know each individual, but I can say your group representative, um, when they submitted the work, showed an understanding of how to write a balanced chemical equation for the decomposition of rubidium nitrate. So and just remember that the decomposition reaction for the molecule means I have the molecule and it's going to drive me to the elemental form, right? I have a molecule, and then I'm going to break it up. So the product of reaction, this side of the arrow, moving in this way, are, are going to be my individual elements. Now, what minor thing that was wrong on the second problem is it asked for the balanced equation for the formation. And some of you all still put the molecule over here and the components over here. Realize the arrow, then we have to go the other way. For formation reaction, you're going to have the elements over here and you're going to have the product being the, the larger construction molecule on this side of the arrow. So you're producing the greater construction on a formation. On a decomposition, you're taking the greater construction and you're breaking it down into pieces. So for the second one, write the balanced equation for the formation of sodium hydrosulfate. You're going to produce for the formation of... So your pieces are going to drive you to that for the formation of. If we had said for the decomposition of this same molecule, it would have been, that would have been for the decomposition of sodium hydrosulfate. Okay. So it, it's important, you know, right now maybe you're thinking it's a, it's a minor issue, not a big deal. It's a big deal. They have the arrow going the wrong way. So in the decomposition from here to the components, for the formation, this would be on the other, the, on the arrowhead side of the reaction equation, and produced in that way. But any questions on writing those formation or those reactions and then balancing them? I mean, once you got to the balancing part, it seemed to go pretty well. So just balancing out, making sure the same element count was on both sides of the reaction arrow. Same number of sodium, same number of hydrogens, same number of sodiums, and the same number of oxygens. I recall now there was one group that kind of kept the sulfate together and they balance the sulfates, okay? That's not, you want to break it down for our purposes all the way down to the elements. So you're going to have a sodium group, a sodium count, a hydrogen count, a sulfur count, and an oxygen count. When I break it down like that, the first thing I'm going to do, remember, is to look at that now and say, I've broken it down into its elemental forms. Are there any homonuclear diatomics? Are there? Yeah, we got H2. And oxygen is a homonuclear diatomic, right? So now I look over here, I've got four oxygens. I could go ahead and write the matrix. Sodium, hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, reactants, products, balance it, see the gaps. But now we're a little bit more proficient. Hopefully look at this and say, wait a minute. One sodium, that's good. One hydrogen, no, that's not good. I need two, right? I need at least two hydrogens. So let me throw this in front. Okay, now I'm going to start again. Two sodiums, I need two sodiums, okay? Two hydrogens, I've got two hydrogens, two sulfurs, I need two sulfurs, and eight oxygens, so I need eight oxygens. So two, 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 eight, two, 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 eight. Okay. 
to any questions on one or two? I mean, I, most of, like I said, every got one right. This was just one of the little nuances of number two. You put the reaction arrow the wrong way, and you held the sulfurs together. That's the sulfate polyatomic ion together, which you need to break it up. Number three, is that not a mobile problem? So number three, we're going to take octane. Octane, and you see the fuel pump, it'll tell you how much octane is in the gasoline, because octane is the explosive element that's going to actually make gas do its job. It's the thing that you're combusting to make the ignition, the expansion, the cylinders moving up and down, driving the shaft, turning the transmission, driving your wheels. It's the burning of octane. So the automobile uses energy gain from burning evaporated gasoline. Write a balanced equation for the combustion of octane, an important component of gasoline. Include the phase symbols in your equation. Okay. So there's one where it said include the phase symbols. But, so we're going to do that. Read it again. An automobile uses the energy gain from burning evaporated gasoline. Okay. Evaporated gasoline. What is the phase of my octane? Uh, gas. It's evaporated. It's a gas. Okay. It, the engine uses evaporated gasoline, of which this is a component of gasoline. So this is going to be gaseous. Right? The combustion of this, if, I have, if I'm trying to produce the combustion of octane, what does that tell me about my formula? It's reacting with oxygen. I'm going to be reacting with oxygen. <laughs> what is the phase of my oxygen? Just think about it. Your cars, does it use solid oxygen or liquid oxygen? You know, do you have bales of oxygen in your trunk? Or, you know, if you fill up one at the gas station, put gas in one, put oxygen in the other tank so they can mix them? Now it's pulling the oxygen out of the air. That oxygen is also gaseous. All we know is it's combustion of this. It's a carbon hydrogen chain. It's not going to form a metal oxide. So the product of combustion is going to be carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide in gaseous form and water in gaseous form. Now, you will at times have water dripping out your tailpipe. That's not, that is the product of reaction. Okay, the water from reaction in your engine. That is the water, it's in a different phase now because as it goes out the tailpipe, it's getting cooled by the air around it and it's condensing out, much like Grandpappy still, right? It's condensing out the evaporated water and making it liquid form and that's why it's dripping out your tailpipe. It's gone from a gaseous phase to a liquid phase as it travels down the tailpipe, which is why the exhaust systems rust out. Okay. From the outside because of the salt and the brine and getting wet through normal driving, but from the inside because sometimes they're bathed with water from the product of combustion in the engine that's condensing as it goes out of the tailpipe. So the question says, uh, write a balanced chemical equation for the combustion. There's our reaction equation, it's just not balanced yet. Let's check to see if it is balanced, and if it's not balanced, we'll balance it. So again, carbons, hydrogens, oxygen, Cho, reactants, products, and let's do a count. We've got eight carbons, 18 hydrogens, two oxygens. On the product side, we have one carbon, we have two hydrogens, and we have three Oxygens. Am I right? Okay, I'm just checking because I'm doing it with you. Now let's go through. What are we going to hit? We can do it one of two ways, right? We can go with what are we lacking and build it up, or we can say what do we have too much and use fractionals to bring it down. Which do you prefer? Is there a consensus? I'd recommend building up. Building up, but remember when you're done, if you build up, you got when you're done, you've got to look through and see if there's a what's the greatest common factor to reduce all the coefficients back down. And if you do the, let's bring it down and use fractional multipliers, make sure you're done, that you have no fractional coefficients. You've got to multiply it up to make whole numbers. Let's go ahead and balance this one then. Looking for where are we lacking, what do we need more of? Carbon. 
Okay? So we're going to build up eight. We need eight carbons on the product side. The only place carbon exists is in this molecule here. So if we put eight in front of that, we now have eight carbon, and we have 16 oxygen. Remember, the other trick is to look at your elemental form and save it for last. So we're going to do oxygen last, assuming that we're going to need more in the reactant side. Because it's in its elemental form, we can adjust this number and not change anything else. Would it be 17 oxygen? Yes, it would be. Thank you. We get eight from the carbon dioxide, eight molecules is 16 plus one from the water. Okay. Hydrogen. All right. So hydrogen, we need 18. We have two. The only place it occurs is in the water molecule. So to get 18 of them, what do we do? Nine. Coefficient of nine. That takes our hydrogen then to 18. And our oxygen, we have 9 plus 16. Is that right? 25, okay. So now we need to balance the oxygen. We have sets of 2, and we need 25. You could do this long process, or now we can do a hybrid method, right? This is, this is true so far. We're just not balanced yet. Let's do a hybrid. Let's now look at fractional, right? That, to me, this would be the step where you go, okay, wait a minute. I can, I can get this in even increments. I can make this 26, but I can't make it 25. I can make it, I can make it anything even because it's sets of two, but I need to make it odd. Now, one way I could do that would be to go ahead and multiply everything by two right now and then build it up to 50 because 50 is even. That's one way I could do it. But hopefully at this point you go, wait a minute. I'm balanced except for this one. It's an elemental form. I need 25. How do we get 25 out of sets of two? 12 and a half, right. So if I go 12 and a half, that's going to give me 25. See, that's kind of a hybrid way of doing it. Now that I've got 12 and a half, I've got 1, 12 and a half, 8, and 9. I can't leave it that way. So because I use the fractional method, I've got to go back and make sure that I have no fractional coefficients in my answer. This is balanced, but I have a fractional coefficient. I need to get rid of the, co the fractional coefficient. How do I do that? Multiply every <clears throat> denominator. Great. Right. Multiply every coefficient by the denominator of my fractional coefficient. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to multiply everything here by 2. It's going to change this to 2, changes this to 25, changes this to 16, and changes this to 18. And now we're balanced. Because if we look at this, we can do a check right now. We assume it's balanced, but let's check it. We've got two sets of 8, which is 16, and two sets of 18 which is 36, and we've got one set or one set of 25 sets of two, so we're going to 50. Would you agree with that? Now looking at the product side, we've got 16 carbons from 16 carbon dioxides. Hydrogens, we've got 18 sets of two, which is 36. And for oxygens, we've got 16 twos, which is 32, and 18 ones, which gives us 50. So now they're both balanced. It's balanced across by the coefficients, by using a fractional coefficient here and then doubling every one of them to get rid of the fractional. All right, so that's number three. Number four, the mass of an argon atom in grams. What is the mass? of an argon atom in grams. Argon over here is showing 30.39.95. So is it in your book probably rounded up to 40? Okay. So it's 40 AMU per atom, right? Let's say that, let's go ahead and use that. Let's say argon is 40 AMU. 
How are we going to compute the grams? How many grams is that? Okay, it's actually 39.9 in the front. Remember, we have that nice little statement of equality that's given to us. That 1 AMU, or 1.00 AMU, is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. On your practice problem page, look at the very top. It gives you the two statements of equality that you need. 1 AMU is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the 24th negative 24 grams, and that one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or molecules. So we know that an argon atom is 39.9 AMUs. How many grams is that? We're just going to take the 39.9 AMUs and multiply it by 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams, and that'll give us the mass of the argon atom in grams. 6.62 times 10 to the negative 23rd, but that, it's just 39.9 times the statement of equality made into a conversion factor. It's pretty straightforward. So questions on how to take AMUs to grams? Or in the case of argon, 39.9 AMU times 1 AMU per 1.66 times 10 to negative 24 grams, which will give me an answer in actually just going to give me an answer in grams, but I'm going to leave it at that. AMUs cancels AMUs and leaves me with grams. Number five asks us what is the mass of an aluminum dichromate molecule in kilograms? Okay, so we're going to start, first of all, with aluminum dichromate. We have an aluminum and a dichromate. Pardon? Number five? Yes, nobody got this one right. <laughs> So it's aluminum dichromate. These, these are the basic ions that make it up. Remember, this is a polyatomic ion, dichromate, and aluminum. So this polyatomic ion, covalently bonded, but acts as a as an ion, bonds with an aluminum ion. Now, what are the coefficients? Let's say Al to the X to the Y. Right? What are the values of X and Y to make up aluminum dichromate? Thank you. What are the co or what are the subscripts here? Aluminum and chromium, dichromate. Excuse me. Right. Think about it. Right. So let's start by thinking about what does the aluminum ion want to become? This is a blast from the past. Okay, we're going back a few modules. Aluminum. Aluminum's over here. It's a column three A element. Okay. Aluminum wants to become. positive. Okay. It's a metal. It's on the left side of the jagged line. Aluminum is barely a metal, but it's a metal. So it wants to become positive. Dichromate. The polyatomic ion has a charge of two, two negative. How am I going to balance those two things so they have an aluminum dichromate molecule with a balanced charge, a zero net charge? Ignore the charges, transpose the subscripts. So it becomes an aluminum 2 dichromate 3. Okay, so that's the molecule we're dealing with now, where it says, what is the mass of this molecule? An Al2 Cr207 sub 3 molecule. So what do I have to do to figure out the mass of this molecule? Well, rather than jumping all the way to kilograms, which I know we have to go to eventually, or even going to grams, let's start with the most basic. Let's figure out what is the mass of this element in AMU. 
Because if I can figure out how many AMUs I have in one molecule, I can convert that using the 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th to how many grams are in that molecule. And then I can divide that by a factor of 10 to the third, giving how many kilograms are in that molecule. So we'll start by, what is the mass of aluminum dichromate? Well, two aluminums. Aluminums have a mass of 26.98, so probably it's 27 in your book. So look at, let me look at the key real quick and see how they did it. Yep, 27.0. Chromium. So these are my two aluminums. I'm going to have... Chromium, right? How many chromiums are we going to have? Six. Six of them, and each one of them is 52.0. And then I need oxygens. How many oxygens? 21. Now, I'm not going to write all those out, okay? Um, the reason I'm doing this is I want you to think about it if you need to in terms of precision and significant figures. To think of this as adding up, adding them up rather than just simply multiplying. It, it, it's, an, it's a little nuanced. Don't worry about it. But that's the way I tend to think about it. So what you're going to end up with is 2 times 27 plus 6 times 52.0 plus 21 times... See, we're doing oxygen, 16.0. And as you get those three numbers and add them all up, the book says that we have 702 AMUs. If there are 702 AMUs of mass in one aluminum dichromate molecule. Because I know what this is in AMUs, I can now take the AMUs and multiply that by 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams per AMU, for one AMU, right? That's going to give me my answer in grams. But I don't want an answer in grams. It says give me the answer in kilograms. So I can do that, get the answer, and then divide by 1,000. Or I can just do that right now and one kilogram is 1,000 grams. Grams cancels grams and leaves me with kilograms. And so doing that math, the book tells me I get 1.17 times 10 to the negative 24 by doing this math. This many AMUs per molecule times this many grams, because one AMU is equal to that many grams, statement of equality, turned into a conversion factor. But I don't want it in my answer in grams, I want my answer in kilograms, so I need one more conversion factor that takes me from grams to kilograms. I do the math, and that is my answer.